Okay, now the next chapter, The Secret Science, is chapter six, and the subject is sex. It's a short chapter, so I'm going to supplement it with something by Walter Russell that he had to say about sex, which I have on my computer screen. Okay, sex is life. In sex is found the mystery of man's life. It may be considered as the guardian of the vital flame in the body. When it is exhausted, death takes place. Exoterically, sex is considered only as the center of the body destined for the purpose of reproduction. And this, therefore, is the difference between male and female. Esoterically, it may be considered a powerful generating center and producer of electric, no, electromagnetic power, which constantly vibrates like electricity. This power emanates directly from the original source, that is, from God, and its mission is maintenance of life. It is due to this that life emanates from sex, and from there is transmitted to the different body centers. Nothing less than the mystery of God is hidden in sex, for its function is to create and bring to life a new being who carries the divine spark. Thus, if God is our Father, it is obvious that he becomes manifest through sex. As a result of religious education, there is at present a deprecatory, I just can't mouth that, deprecatory concept of sex, which many times symbolizes something obscene and injurious to man. This has been the cause of innumerable aberrations of the libido. It is necessary that sex should return to its true role as a maintainer of life and that it should be separated from original sin. Sexual education is extremely important as it is essential that human beings be taught to use sex consciously to create a better life. Men as well as women suffer the consequences of their scant sexual education at marriage where they are surrounded by erroneous and antiquated concepts which prevent them in many instances from attaining real sexual harmony. This lack of education is noted especially in the younger generation who, due to lack of an adequate psychological guide, suffer a variety of deviations of the libido. Many turn to solitary vices and others believe that the most important proof of manhood is uncontrolled sexual activity. Parents are mainly to blame as they generally find it taboo to mention sex in front of their children. This forces children to make their own investigations and in the majority of cases they acquire a variety of complexes and restraints. It is curious to note the lack of importance given to the sexual aspect, considering the fact that it is the hidden motive of a great part of human actions, as was well understood by fraud. According to the Hermetic Principle, the generation of life is eternal and continual. Nothing can exist that has not been created by two forces, a passive or feminine force and an active or masculine force. In man is the active or positive part of creative power, and due to this he does not have control over his instincts, which at times place him on the level of an animal, which procreates impelled by magnetic currents. Sex is the great producer, regulator, and director of life but it is also a great hypnotizer, which keeps the human species in the mechanical state we have noted in previous pages. The Bible says that the serpent tempted Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, and that as they fell into temptation, they were expelled from paradise. Paradise symbolizes the state when man was in permanent contact with his own spirit. The expulsion from paradise represents the loss of this contact when he surrendered to uncontrolled passion. 
upon surrendering to his passions and using sex indiscriminately, he little by little lost his faculty of seeing the truth, as his sensorial impressions were so many and continuous that they upset his mental function. The biblical symbol of the serpent as the cause of the expulsion from paradise is curious, as in this is hidden a secret directly related to the sad mechanical condition of man. The importance given to Kundalini, or the sleeping serpent, is well known to lovers of Hindu literature and yoga. It is said, no, it is said that this is the power which is latent in the base of the spinal column. And when it is possible to awaken this power, it supplies all kinds of magical powers. It is nevertheless overlooked that this is precisely the power which is acting within the human being, keeping him hypnotized and preventing him from seeing the truth. When man started to develop as such on earth, he was directed by a collective spirit, which directed the propagation of the species, urging couples to come together only during certain times of the year. When man acquired the power to procreate voluntarily at any moment, he freed himself from the collective spirit and started to acquire a certain degree of independence and free will. When the object of the sexual act is to beget a child, it is an act of creation, and each time it takes place there is produced a power for good or evil according to the quality of the union, that is, if it has been purely bestial or spiritual. When there is only a union of bodies and not of souls, which is most common, it is the same as mechanically stimulating the sexual centers, producing perpetual dissatisfaction. Only when the simulation, no, only when the simultaneous union of body and soul is their real deep, intimate, spiritual, and divine pleasure in the true sexual union. This is the difference between sinning and not sinning as far as this problem is concerned. Only those who join beastily sin. It is not sufficient that a marriage be legalized by the church to have the grace of God, as in nature there are no human laws. From the viewpoint of nature, which is perfect, a marriage is any couple who have formed a matrimonial aura which is the union on the invisible plane of their etheric bodies. When this matrimonial aura is absent, a marriage can be legalized and blessed by the church a hundred times, but will be false and a lie, as there will only have been coupling of bodies. For the neotypes, I would explain that the etheric double is a body of subtle matter, which is invisible and which is indissolubly bound to the physical body, being its exact replica. All alterations of the double are immediately apparent in the body. Everything sexual revolves around one thing, the ethereal magnetism. In all sexual contact, there is an interchange of magnetism between man and woman. This magnetic vibration powerfully influences the happiness or misfortune of the individual. A person with bad luck or with a pessimistic, unfortunate, and unhappy magnetic vibration will transmit this at the time of union. Magnetism is that which produces sexual attraction and falling in love, and this is what the symbols of Eros and Cupid represent. It is because of this that many infatuations end abruptly when this magnetic discharge occurs, as love, in the vulgar sense, is only an ethereal magnetic drunkenness or saturation. Of course, this is not real love, only a magnetic condensation. In the field of amorous attraction, the more magnetism a woman possesses, the more she will attract the opposite sex, although she may not be good-looking. 
What has been called sex appeal is a magnetic, attractive power which is invisible and intangible. It is usual to see very beautiful women who have no attraction for men as they lack sexual ethereal magnetism. There are people who, by inheritance, lead a healthy life, and as they possess great self-control, are great accumulators of magnetism, and they are, they are veritable natural magnets with attractive powers, both economical and sentimental. There are women, on the other hand, who are always unlucky in love, in spite of being physically attractive, as they lack magnetic attractive power. If they marry, they are not capable of holding the man for long and, and are in the end abandoned. Here I will give some instructions so that both men and women may accumulate an abundance of electromagnetic power which will help them to find success in life. Sexual magnetic power is lost through three main channels which we must eliminate in order to produce a gradual accumulation. These channels are negative emotions, uncontrolled desires, and negative imaginative states. There is a close relationship between the emotional and instinctive states. A woman during a jealous crisis, for example, expends her mag magnetism uselessly and therefore loses her attractiveness to men and ages per prematurely as life flows from her. A jealous, irritable, and dominating woman expels all her sexual energy through her heart and gradually becomes unattractive. For a woman to attract a man powerfully, she must first of all have great control over her feelings so that her heart will not disperse the magnetism produced by sex. When she attains this, all will be possible. Man, on the other hand, should give preferential attention to training and dominating his sexual side, which is his weak point, or Achilles' heel. In the education of desires, we also find a great source of power. If a person denies himself the satisfaction of a passing desire and can keep this current of energy alive, he will be able to increase his volume of magnetic power. I will illustrate this with an example. An individual receives some very good news. His first reaction is to run and tell his friends and relatives. If he consciously postpones this desire for a few days, he will accumulate a certain quality now, a certain quantity of magnetism. Imaginatively, it is necessary to attract, no, to attain a certain state of control, which eliminates negative and morbid thoughts, allowing on, only optimism and happiness. A man who desires to attract a woman must be sincere, gallant, understanding, strong, but sensitive, masculine, and viral. He must have an alert and powerful mind, for if in woman beauty is both physical and within the soul, in man it is in his intelligence. The more intelligent the man, the more beautiful he appears in the eyes of a woman. Women, more than anything else, seek support from man in every way, and therefore he must be ready to supply the strength she lacks. Man and woman embody the two great principles of strength and beauty. A woman who desires to attract and hold on to a man must develop the following characteristics, woman, womanliness, sweetness, and an understanding of the beauty of the soul. She must be wife, lover, friend, sister, and mother. She must never make the man feel enslaved or deprived of his liberty. The key to a couple's happiness is in mutual tolerance, in being more willing to give than to receive. Nevertheless, in order for there to be perfect sexual harmony between a couple, it is necessary to erase or eliminate all instinctive and psychic wounds received during life. These are the main cause of the majority of matrimonial failures. 
It is not unusual, for example, for a man who has been very pampered by his mother during childhood to seek a woman who will do likewise, and from whom he will demand the same attention as a mother gives a child. It is also not unusual for a woman to seek a father image. All this very much influences the first sexual experience, and that sets the course of future life. A man who has had his first sexual experience with a prostitute, for example, when he marries, seeks a woman with her knowledge and experience. If the first sexual union in man is important, in woman this is the first true and decisive course of her future life, her happiness or unhappiness. For a woman who is a virgin resembles a blank page waiting for a script. It is not unusual that a woman who has waited for her wedding night with stars in her eyes, but who was brutally possessed by a man with passionate instincts, has built up a deep subconscious aversion of man. If later she seeks happiness with another, the ghost of her first experience will always rise up and could cause complete frigidity. Another libido deviation of woman is auto-eroticism. Uh, auto er I'm saying that wrong. That is when she seeks to excite herself by an erotic imagination of jealousy to increase the pleasure of the sexual act. This also applies to the one who starts a quarrel just to surrender to a man at the height of the quarrel and go abruptly from there to amorous delight. All these nuances or sexual complexes should be erased from the subconscious by means of adequate mental hygiene and rigid self-discipline. When willpower is not sufficient to accomplish this, help should be sought from a guide who is able to erase these impressions from the cerebral nerve cells. And in difficult cases, this can only be done by a psychiatrist with knowledge of the great mystery of the mind. Erotic imaginations of a woman so deeply influence her companion that he may well deceive her if the woman imagines this is so, as her imaginative vibration obliges him to do so. Once all these negative recordings have disappeared, there will be a natural, healthy, and sensible union, which is the only one which produces harmony and happiness. Another case I must mention due to its importance is the masculine woman. Masculinity is pronounced, no, masculinity is produced in a woman when she is joined to a weak man, and she is strong and dominant. Little by little she becomes more active and masculine, and the more, and the man more timid and depressed, as she is absorbing all the masculine magnetism, leaving behind only a passive or feminine magnetism. This masculinity which this woman absorbs develops in her obvious masculine characteristics, strength, power and domination, aggressiveness, impulsiveness, love of domineering, audacity and decision, and the man becomes even more feminine until he is incapable of making a decision and hands over the reins to the woman. If this couple has sons, they also will be victims of this whirlwind of energy absorption, which has transformed this woman, and they will come entirely under her influence and show marked feminine characteristics as their masculine magnetism has been absorbed by their mother. This absorption can lead these children to sexual inversion. Neither men nor women are aware that they have in their character certain traits of the opposite sex. A man, for example, could show the following traits which should be a woman's prerogative. And a few of these are jealousy, indecision, fear, volubility, passiveness, and hysteria. And in a woman, the desire to dominate a man, wanting to change and possess him. 
All this masks the great secret of magnetism. And this secret is that men, as well as women, carry a certain number of traits of the opposite sex. True and sincere students will understand this mystery in all its magnitude. <clears throat> the correct use of sex is the basis of occult spiritual development. It is sad to see all these occultist beginners who believe that it is sufficient to sing mantrams, yoga breathing, or chant prayers to the highest to see the light. It is also sad to see those who seek development through certain Hindu traditions, which call for celibacy in men as a means to attain magical powers, for, in the end, many of them become feminine or inverted due to becoming magnetically depolarized. In connection with the subject of sex, we deem it necessary to denounce the crime committed against babies during the mother's pregnancy if she continues sexual relations with her husband after becoming pregnant. The being which is within the mother receives at that moment a strong current of sexual energy which remains indelibly engraved on its fragile nature provoking after its birth a premature sexual awakening and a variety of unbalanced emotional conditions, as well as sexual inversion. During this delicate period, the woman should avoid all strong emotions, quarrels, and worries, and should shun any depressive atmosphere. It is a pity that man has not studied more deeply the means of improving the human species, dedicating instead his time to perfecting some breeds of animals. To conclude this chapter, we give the key to sexual magnetism. <clears throat> Man is active, is the one who gives, the one who seeks and must continually give. Woman is passive, continually seeking to be absorbed or taking that within her in order to conceive. He is the creator, and she the coagulator. From this union is born binary, and subsequently the tenary, ternary. The binary, to reach perfection, should be converted into unity. By studying active and passive magnetism, it is possible to understand the true sense of the union between man and woman. And that completes that chapter and now I'm going to move my my focus up to this that was written by Walter Russell higher sex principles it is gen generally understood that sexual intercourse is limited to an actual cohabitation between males and females of each species this concept is so fundamentally a part of our present knowledge that it will shock the reader to learn that every physical relation between any two oppositely polarized units of nature in the universe is a low-voltage sex relation. Cohabitation is merely a sufficiently high-voltage sex union to short-circuit the two poles of the human electric battery. When this happens, the human battery is dead until recharged by the heartbeat and breathing process, just as the electric battery is dead from the same cause until recharged by the pulsing heartbeat of the electric current. A contact between opposite units is not necessary for sex relation, for the contact is already there. It is perpetually there in the electric union which connects every corpuscle of the universe with every other corpuscle. Every positive corpuscle in the universe is constantly interchanging with every negative one. This sex union and its continuity is what keeps the universe a continuous one. That is what constitutes the universal heartbeat of God's body. In other words, low voltage sexual cohabitation is a continued and perpetual interchange of all things in nature with all other things. It is through sex union of all things with all other things that this universe is perpetually repeated in all of its forms. High voltage sex unions between two mates 
who are sufficiently balanced to be potent, will reproduce forms like the two. But the perpetual sex union of all things which takes place continually between all things actually determines the forms of all things. Universal electric interchange between universal opposites determines all forms and gradually transforms all forms. Good examples of such transformations through universal interchange are the transformations of all animal and vegetable forms in various ages, such as the Carboniferous Age and the Age of Huge Reptiles, such as the Dinosaur. Forms of animal and vegetable life had to conform with atmospheric conditions arising out of the youth of the planet and its nearer proximity to the sun. In other words, light pressures conditioned all forms and the light of dual electric waves interweaves those forms into the patterns which polarize pressures of light determined for them. Transformation of man. A cultured man will be transformed mentally and physically by sufficiently intimate social intercourse with thieves, thugs, and prostitutes. The change is effected through electric interchange of man and environment and that interchange is also sex. Sexual intercourse will hasten the transformation and, and also reproduce du duplicate forms. But the social intercourse alone will produce and reproduce similar forms of all units sexually affected by the increasingly higher voltage of close contact between the units of any environment. The hills become a part of the man who lives in them, and the man becomes a part of the hills such a man loves nature's rhythms playing on the harps of the wind. The poet is transformed into the appearance of a poet because of his intercourse with all beautiful things. An intercourse between all material things is electrical. All electrical expression is divided into sexed pairs, positive and negative. The universe is one unit. All things in it are all other things. All are involved in each other. The basis of positive and negative electrical expression is sex. Sex is of all things from the beginning. Sex begins when light begins. Sex is desire for the appearance of being, which constitutes the appearance of existence. Nothing can be without the desire to be. All things are which desire to be. Desire dominates all thinking. Desire dominates all matter. All desire is sex desire. The greatest desire of all creating things, organic and inorganic, is to increase their appearance of separability from all other things in the universe. In other words, to stand out more and more conspicuously as a significant individual rather than a part of another one. The building of one's individual separate self is the most difficult attribute to wrest from nature and the most difficult to maintain. Millions of years of indefatigable work are required for a man to unfold from an insignificant individual to a genius. Each individual self is the sum total of all his sex decisions. Each person is what he is because of his sex decisions. To insulate oneself from all unfavorable sex unions, voluntary, involuntary, social, and sexual, and to contact only that which will build a self into a great self is the supreme achievement of each moment of each life. The universal thinker of all thoughts, which flows through us, is forever planning perfect expression of the divine ideal in each of us. The entirety of universal power is concentrated upon each one of us to fashion us into the forms of our desire. The form of our desire is forever unfolding into the universe of form to manifest our thinking as co-creator with God's thinking and refolding into the seed of us to perpetually repeat that form. When man becomes sufficiently ennobled as a self-creation to become a conscious co-creator with the universal one, it should be his supreme task 
to perfect himself by using the free will given him for that purpose. He then unfolds in the pattern of his desire. He himself molds himself mentally into a genius or a moron as he chooses, or physically into a Hercules or atrophied impotent weakling also as he chooses. The priceless gift of free will implies a trusteeship of worthiness to use it constructively. For if used destructively, the whole universe will help one to retrograde as it will help one to progress. Our hell is self-made even as our heaven is. Each person should guard his interchange with all other people and things in his environment and choose that alone which ennobles his self. This can be achieved only by association with other noble selves of his own kind and with beautiful things in his environment and with still more beautiful imaginings of his inspired inner vision. Such well-chosen intercourse will transform each self from moment to moment, from the attained perfection of this moment to the attained perfection of the next moment. The greater and more far-reaching transformer of a self is balanced sexual intercourse. One's entire pattern of self-form and even one's immortal rhythm of eons of building is instantly and violently changed by every sexual intercourse with an unbalanced other half. The rhythm of each becomes the rhythm of both. Promiscuity in either social or sexual intercourse is the greatest destroyer of individuality of self or of type or of acquired power. Promiscuity with unbalanced mates condemns one to the backward path. All things are divided into equal halves. All halves are unbalanced. Each type should seek its balancing other half for its self-recreation or rebirth through balance. That is one meaning and purpose of sex. The other meaning is reproduction. Sex union is mentally creative as well as physically. Human intellect has advanced beyond the animal because of acquired mental creativeness through sex. Animal sex urge is for physical reproduction only. The mental recreative urge is not in them. Animals in nature breed true to balance, while man flagrantly violates this principle. The greatest blessing which can come to any half unit in God's creating universe is the finding of its balancing other half. The search for that other half is the supreme urge which makes of man the perpetual searcher for the supreme discovery which is seldom found. The perpetual search of man has a name and the word for it is romance. Okay, I think I can read a little more. A meritorious rise to fame frequently becomes ignoble through over-attention to sex practice. Fine qualities that have produced success become dulled by a breaking of the moral law which taints the whole way of life. The descent of an individual or nation begins at the moment of the turning of desire away from a high moral standard to a promiscuous one. Individuals, nations, and whole world civilizations have failed from the same material cause of too much luxury, too much money, and too much easy living. These are the material things that sap the ambition of man or nation and tempt him away from the spirit of work and achievement through which he rose. Any change of desire in man automatically changes the character of his environment, his associations, and his life practices. Any such changes begin at once to reflect their patterns into the pattern of the man, or even into the national and world pattern. This is not theory, but inescapable law. High electric pressure lowers toward low electric pressure much more readily than the reverse effect. Highly developed culture follows the same law. It is difficult to rise from low standards of culture to high, 
but easy to fall from high to low. It is pitiful to see young people who have struggled so hard to climb their mountaintop fall back so quickly through ignorance of this one greatest danger. The aristocrat of Park Avenue will slowly become tainted with the moral, mental, and physical environment of the slums simply by living there long enough. His language will show the change in his self-pattern. His very walk and gestures will show it, and his body will very quickly evidence it in every phase of its expression. Even the evangelist is affected by it, no matter how he immunizes immunizes his thought and actions from its influence. His countenance will change to express the thinking and actions of his electrical environment, in spite of himself. His ideas and the inherited ideas of his ancestors will also become more and more undermined in accordance with the intensity of his relations in, to, this, to his environment. Add sexual reg- relations to this, and the de- degeneration of his unfolding self pattern is greater through such intimate contact. With each sexual experience, the pattern of the blood cells is instantly affected and sequentially the brain. The self-pattern which every man is building for himself is the electric waveform record of what each person now in is in wait The self-pattern which every man is building for himself is the electric waveform record of what each person now is at this precise moment. It is each man's standard of his self. That standard is very difficult to raise to higher levels and very easy to sink toward lower levels. Nothing in life aids decadence so effectively as wrong mating and promiscuity. For each person either ascends or descends in body pattern to the level of the mate he chooses. This is a thought which the rather free-thinking youth of today should weigh more carefully for today's thinking in sex practice is causing a decadence of our entire civilization, which is very noticeable in our mass culture. Our arts are already decadent. Our bodies will follow this degenerate trend in due time, unless the trend is checked. Take note of natural law working out this principle on other human relations throughout environment. Hill-born men or prairie-born men or men who follow the sea become hill lovers or prairie lovers or lovers of the sea because they have interchanged one with another the electric wave forms which make each thing that with which it has sufficiently interchanged. This love of hill country or sea by hill or sea-born men is not a matter of their personal taste It is because the electrical wave pattern of the hills or sea environment has interchanged with their own physical and mental patterns. The hills, the sea, and the man actually become a part of each other. Remove that part and man is uncomfortable. He misses it as he would miss a finger or arm if it were removed. A clergyman who becomes a bandit will soon look and act like a bandit. Moral and spiritual patterns thus degenerate as inexorably as physical ones. If such remote contacts recreate highly cultured people into decadent ones, how much more so do such intimate contacts as sex relations degrade them? Every sex relation between unequally polarized mates might be likened to a drop of ink put into a pail of pure water. The pure water purifies the ink to some extent, and to an extent, to an equal extent, the ink defiles the water. Impurity of both is the immediate punishment of every two unequal unions, for each becomes the other to some extent in every sex relation. The gentleman who thinks it but an incident to have sex relations with a prostitute will descend toward her level in mental ideals and physical pattern to that extent in which both have exchanged their electric patterns. The higher is pulled down further than the lower one is raised. That is the law. High spiritual levels sink more quickly into low physical ones because the lower one has less spiritual and mental powers 
for interchanging. The gentleman descending to the underworld soon takes on the standards of the underworld, and nature is exceedingly slow in giving his former standards back to him. Well, I would read more of this, but I'm about out of time here. I will, maybe I will make a part two to this. This is the Dove Lady, over and out for now.